Hello, Internet. We're glad you can join us for another episode of the Bros Bros. You knows. I'm your host, Viet. On April 12th, fighter Joel Carvalho died as a result of head injuries he sustained in a professional MMA fight against Charlie Ward. Just weeks after New York became the 50th state to legalize MMA, we have the fifth death surrounding a professional bout since 2007. The seriousness and severity of brain injury from high-impact sports like football have begun to pick up mainstream interest, with blockbuster movies like Concussion seemingly putting a spotlight on organizations like the NFL. And while the movie itself is about concussions, it is more about the consequences that result from repeated brain trauma. More accurately, the movie is really about CTE, or Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. A brain disease found in patients who have suffered repetitive brain trauma. Scientists have known about this pattern of abnormal brain cells since the 1920s when it was discovered in boxers. And while it has been almost a hundred years, scientists still have only a frightfully fragmented account of what is really going on. There is no set number of concussions that result in CTE, and in fact, CTE has been identified in non-concussed brains. If the public fears their own ignorance when it comes to brain injury, it is right in line with the medical community at large. There is still a lot that is unknown, and doctors have yet to make sense of it all. And that may be the scariest part. CTE doesn't result from fluke collisions or vicious haymakers. It can result from something seemingly innocuous in nature. Conor McGregor was in attendance of the Carvalho fight to cheer on his SBG teammate, Charlie Ward. He publicly commented after the fight that it could have been stopped sooner. Some speculate that the damage was done in earlier rounds as online videos show a relatively routine stoppage. The fact that this stoppage was quicker than many and still ended with someone dying should give the MMA community pause. And while we will try to internalize it and make sense of it all, some of us trying to blame someone for it, the ref, the medical staff, somebody... The truth is, these fighters, in a sense, sign away their health when they contractually agree to fight. Brain trauma is part of the sport. We are so honored to have on the show an MMA legend, Mr. Gary Big Daddy Goodridge. The retired heavyweight thrilled fans for years with his gutsy and violent performances in Pride FC, the UFC, and K1. He has since been diagnosed with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and has become an ambassador of sorts for fighter safety. He's a very honest man, and frankly, he's one of the nicest guys. It's a pleasure to get the chat with Gary Big Daddy Goodrich. We have a real treat for you listeners out there. Mr. Gary Big Daddy Goodrich, this is Viet with BBYK. It is an absolute honor to be joined on this podcast by a true legend of the sport. Now, Everyone knows you from your professional fighting days at Pride, K1, and the UFC. But before that, you were a world champion arm wrestler. Can you tell us a little bit about those over-the-top days when you were a professional arm wrestler? Um, you know, it was a great time uh, being a professional arm wrestler. I was like the, uh, the idea of going out and showing how, how good I was at what I was doing. And... Uh, Arm wrestling just was one of them strange things that I needed to be involved in, and uh, I loved it. Now, you got your start in boxing from a chance encounter at a department store with a retired boxer, Norm Bell, who you would later train under. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this infamous meeting? Well, you know, we went to the department store, and we had a great time. We had, um, you know, he was... Um, I, I was I was just in the middle of uh, thinking of boxing, and uh, you know, so what I'm gonna try to do with my life at this point. And I thought, well, you know, I always aspire to be uh, something great. That's what I thought. And uh, I, I knew uh, I talked to myself that man, I'm supposed to be doing something, but I'm not sure what I was supposed to be doing. So um, uh, I was talking about it as I'm walking through um, I think it was Towers. And uh, as I'm talking with him, um, talking at the time, um, he was behind me, him. So then we started talking. He says, well, I'm a boxing coach. 
so we started from there. You two did some great things together. You went on to be the Canadian amateur super heavyweight boxing champ. Right. Yes, I was. 1996. That's right. And then you transitioned into mixed martial arts. You made your UFC debut at UFC 8. And then from there, you really fought a who's who's list of the sport's best fighters. You've had notable victories over MMA legends like Don Fry. Let me ask you, who is your favorite mixed martial artist of all time? Of all time, John Jones. And why is that? Why John Jones? Uh, because um, because he's, he's so multi-dimensional. He's not one-dimensional, but uh, he's been in a cruise fighter for, uh, for years to come. Everybody has to live up to his standards. Um, he's, um, he's, he's just multi-dimensional, whether it be a... Uh, Stand up the ground, um, just box and box. You know, well, he, he does have a fight coming up here at UFC 197 against Ovin St. Pru. Are you going to be tuning in to watch that? Absolutely. 100%. Now, Gary, you have an excellent book out. It's called Gatekeeper The Fighting Life of Gary Goodrich. It's an excellent read, and it gives a really good behind the scenes perspective of the world of combat sports. I'm going to put a link down in the description below for those interested in purchasing it. In it, you, you had a quote about Tom Erickson, who you said was screwed over repeatedly because everyone avoided fighting him. Like some went so far as to contractually avoid fighting him. So I want to ask you, in your opinion, what fighter is the most underrated slash underappreciated fighter from your era of fighting? My era, he just said it right there, Tom Erickson. He never got a chance to fight anybody because everybody turned down fights with him. Um, I was the only one that fought. Well, I'm the only one that, fought, that ever fought that ever didn't say no. He never said no either. So um, at the time, would you fight this guy? Yes. Would you fight that guy? Yes. Everybody said, would you fight Tom Erickson? They got no, no, no. He had 100% no. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, something else that was interesting, you said in your book, you said that while the sport of mixed martial arts has grown in popularity in North America, that you didn't think that it would ever achieve the kind of mainstream support it once had in Japan. Uh, with the rise of star fighters like Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor, do you think that Japanese level of mainstream support is now possible in North America? Oh, it definitely is. I, um, the thing about it was uh, North America and Japan. In Japan, it seemed like everybody was involved in um, in doing this. So, so therefore, um, people that didn't know nothing, um, that you never saw, I thought they didn't know nothing about fighting. They'd recognize you on the street and they'd talk to you about fighting. Um, in Japanese, uh, I didn't think I didn't think it was possible for it to go that way. Um, but keep in mind, when I was fighting with the uh, UFC, we were fighting. Um, um, you know, a lot of times I was fighting, it wasn't allowed, you weren't allowed to fight. It was, it was illegal to fight. So therefore, um, I saw the rough, the rough beginning of the, the UFC. You know, it was, uh, it was owned and operated by uh, Bob Meyerowitz and uh, our baby. So that, that was uh, the beginning of, of everything, you know. So it uh, had a lot of video while Japan was booming with MMA. Um, North America was really struggling with it, but now it's a, a total flip-flop. Now, Gary, you have been diagnosed with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and you were really one of the first MMA fighters to really chronicle your struggles publicly. You've said that you should have retired earlier when you first saw signs of trouble, but that as a young man, you felt like perhaps the risk for something else other people had to worry about. You just had to worry about fighting. You had to worry about putting food on the table for your family, providing for your family and your two girls. Do you feel that a better standard pay for fighters might help minimize the risk fighters are willing to take? Oh, absolutely. 100%. The thing is that um, having been diagnosed with CTE and uh, all the other things, um, Everybody would that uh, will only go as far as they will allow them, but they will allow them. So we need, you need to have better people behind you because fighters we do what fighters do. Fighters fight. You know that's all we do. We're supposed to fight. We always go ahead and fight. Um, so other people that tell us no, you can't fight because a fighter will always fight. If there's a fight, you will fight. It's up to the opponent. People that are looking out. 
that that stops it. That's an excellent point, Gary. It's one that you made in your book as well, that sometimes we have to protect the fighters from themselves. We've had some tragic news hit the MMA world the other day when we found out that Portuguese fighter Joao Carvalho passed away three days after sustaining head injuries in his fight at TEF with Charlie Ward. Our thoughts and prayers are with this family. Uh, it was awesome seeing all of these MMA fighters come out and show support for the Carvalho family. Uh, Conor McGregor being one of the most vocal, he said that, quote, I thought that it could have been stopped a little earlier. I feel these referees need to be on the ball a bit. Uh, I do want to add that he went on to praise the medical staff for their work. Um, um, what, 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 did he fight in the UFC or what, what, what organization? This was by a fighting promotion, Total Extreme Fighting. So it, it wasn't the UFC. Uh, Conor McGregor was there in support of his teammate, Charlie Ward. But, but you know what? Anytime you're taking blunt trauma to the head, um, the whole sport is about blunt trauma to the head. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's far safer than boxing, um, but there's still a lot of blunt trauma to the head. So anytime you're taking blunt trauma to the head, there's, there's risk is there. I mean, you sign your life away when you sign all the dotted lines. But absolutely. Um, you need um need proper referees that uh, need to know when things are bad and when they're not. You know, everybody has to live by the same scale. A lot of things that uh, people understand that, oh, yeah, this guy can take, referees think, oh, this guy can take a lot of uh, punishment, so I'll let it go a little longer. No, everybody has to live by the same scale. If you look dizzy, you look done, you, you, you call it right back. You, you said earlier that, you know, fighters fight, and so we need we need our, our cornermen, the support group, to be to be better about being on top of things and protecting our fighters. Do you think another way we could protect fighters is to arm them with a collective voice? High profile MMA fighters like Tim Kennedy have been very vocal about the issue of fighters compensation and unionizing. Do you think that a fighters union could help resolve some of these fighter safety issues? Oh, definitely. Well, as soon as you say fighters union, all the big players are going to want to pull out because it costs us a lot of money. One hundred percent, there needs to be union, and there will be. Um, I don't know if they're ready for it now, but um, there will be a union. Of course, there will be a union. They, they need a union because um, really, they look after they look after their pockets and the fighter. Looking back at your storied career um, and the advice that you were given by your doctors and your supporters at the time. What words of advice do you have to give to the young fighters out there that are getting started in mixed martial arts? Well, the, the, you know, the thing about it is uh, the words that I would have to say, you know what, um, you know, you got a dream, you know, live your dream. Nobody else can live it for you. But uh, you can also minimize the risk of what you're doing um, and listen to your, uh, to your doctors, listen to the people that are handling it. Because, uh, like I said, uh, fighters want to fight. If there's a fight, fighters will fight it. Now, for those that may not be as familiar with CTE, could you describe for our listeners a day in the life of Gary Goodrich and what it's like to live with CTE? So a day in the life of me is, um, you know, I wake up and, um, you know, I'm suffering. I suffer from depression. I suffer from, um, you know, I, 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 I'm in my bed probably 75 to 90 percent of the time. Um, um, that's just something to do, and I get out and do it, and I go back to my bed. Um, um, I have a problem with uh, with leaving my bed because uh, you know depression, uh, CTE for me, depression. Um, so the, the pills, I am I'm not talking about my doctors right now. The pills I have um, take so it takes out uh, the, the, the sharp edge of that, but um, you're still fighting a lot. Um, you're still fighting a lot of depression. I just want to tell you, Gary, you you were a true inspiration to the fans in the ring because of your heart and determination. Now retired from the sport, you're still an inspiration to us all, uh, along with being an active mentor for fighters and, and volunteering within your own community. Uh, you have been a real voice for those suffering from mental health issues. Just checking out your social media, and I'll be putting his social media information in the description below. You guys need to check it out, but it is just filled with messages of hope.
and inspiration and really serves as a touch of direction for those that may have found themselves a bit lost in life. Do you have a message for our listeners out there that may be living with or have a loved one that lives with mental health problems? Well, first of all, I'd like to call uh, the, the problem that I have, it, it, it didn't stem from MMA. And I'd like to make this very clear. MMA is very safe. It was, um, I, um, I, I boxed. I was a Canada, I was a Canada amateur champion of Canada boxing. I got my first concussion in boxing. I quit boxing because of that concussion. Um, and then I went to MMA. I never had, I did seven years of uh, that. I got one concussion from Gilbert Abel with a high kick to the head. That was the only concussion in seven years I got in MMA. And, uh, then I went to K1, and that's where I got that. I did it for seven years. I got 14 concussions in the seven years. So I, I'd like to let people know that now. MMA, I didn't have a problem with MMA. The problem was I played, I did K1. K1 is all about knockouts, uh, continuous knockouts after knockouts after knockouts, and that's what happened. I played the game, and I got knockouts, and I played the game, and I got knockouts more. You know, like I said, I had seven, I had uh, 14 concussions in seven years. That's led to my um, CD. We really appreciate you you clarifying that. I think that whenever you have a tragedy like the one that befell the Carvalho family, the people that may not be as familiar with mixed martial arts, they may try to use this as further evidence to stigmatize the sport in general. All right, well, we're going to wrap things up. Mr. Goodridge, it was such a pleasure getting to speak with you. You are a true legend of the sport, and I wish you all the best in life, my friend. Thank you very much. Bye. Once again, it was such a pleasure getting to chat with Gary Goodrich and some pretty good insight there into the, the mindset of a fighter. We're joined here by a, a fighter in his own right, you know, a, a, a keyboard warrior, a microphone warrior. Uh, he possesses a graphite chin. He's a uh, Matt Two Stripe Alexander. Let me brag on him a little bit. He's actually a three stripe now doing that advanced no gi grappling so he is not one to be messed with matt what's up bro i'm doing all right man except my neck kind of hurts because i got guillotined about fifty-eight thousand times last night Fifty-eight thousand. that's specific you would think you would lose track after you know three well you know i tap pretty quick and uh we only had like a, that was only like 30 minutes so that's why the number so low <laughs> you know, let's just get right into it. I got to talk with Gary about Carvalho's death, and we've been talking a little bit about this, you and I, off the air, but there was the, the scariest thing about it from an MMA fan's perspective is that it wasn't exactly something unusual, that the, the ref didn't exactly make a mistake. I mean, it, I know there were some fighters that were saying maybe it could have been called earlier, but... That would have been like way, way earlier. And when he called it, it was definitely not outside the realm of what generally happens in an MMA fight. The medical team was praised for their timeliness. They had their stuff together. They, they brought him to the hospital. Protocol was followed. We'll have to go back and see if like uh, there were any issues with, with weight cutting and stuff like that. Yeah, I was, ex I was expecting something about weight cutting to come out, but nothing yeah. has come out since then. So that's, it's like a one thing that I thought could have affected it because otherwise it's like man everyone did the right thing respectively in those situations and it was nothing out of the ordinary and that's what makes it so scary it's like there's nothing to pin it on it's like oh we can do this better yeah exactly and you know gary brought up that point when when i was chatting with him that you know as a fighter you kind of understand that when you sign that contract in a way you're kind of signing away your life like what what we're doing isn't safe the other guy's job description is to go in there and to try to violently hurt us to the point where we have to stop where we have to tap out you know like that's the point that's that's the other guy's job and then your job is the to, to do that to him and he was like that's part of the game blunt trauma to the head is is part of the game you you sign up for it if you could do the job and avoid it that'd be great but that's part of the job description as a fighter yeah it's uh pretty insane 
instead of their face. One of the most vocal fighters um, in the aftermath of the Carvalho incident, Conor McGregor was a very out, he was very outspoken afterwards, you know, in, in terms of like giving, giving his, uh, his thoughts to the family. And also, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly where he was coming from. I, I think he was trying to internalize it, but because he's such a public figure, some of that internalization, it, it comes out publicly. Well, we're going to segue into a, a thing we've been working on, a, a little a series we're going to start showcasing on brosbros.com. When, whenever something like this happens, you try to find something that you can blame it on. Because surely this this shouldn't happen. Like death shouldn't be part of what what these guys sign up for. You know, maybe it's got to be the ref's fault, or, or maybe the medical team did something wrong, or or maybe his tr- training staff did something wrong, or or maybe his, the corner guys could have called it quicker. And you know, historically, those are all contributing factors. And like we said, the scary thing this time is it doesn't seem like any of those apply. And I guess for a person like Connor. It just kind of really hits you hard. It's like, well, actually, maybe this can happen. This is part of the job description. It obviously does not happen often. It's very rare. Especially for someone like him, where it's like, he has three losses in his career by submission. Never been knocked out. He's, like, riding high. It's a, it's really kind of a wake-up for that. Like, he's not usually in that position uh, you know, losing or like seeing, you know, God forbid somebody dying, like, it's not supposed to happen. And like, to somebody who's on top of the game, like, at a world class level, that's got to be like pretty eye opening. Especially, you know, since his teammate was the one that was not something he heard about in the news, he was there. Sitting there, uh, he was there in support of his teammate, Charlie Ward. So, big news. Big news hit the MMA world the other day. Uh, probably, probably some of the biggest news that can possibly hit. They're the, the, the biggest fighter in the game right now, the biggest money attraction in UFC history, Mr. Notorious, Conor McGregor, has announced his retirement. Wow. What? I didn't hear what... I told that. I mean... Twitter was set ablaze. He uh, he just wrote up there like decided to retire young. Thanks for the cheese. So uh, here at Bros Bros, we're gonna be sending him a cheese care package to add to his cheese fund. Uh, mainly blue cheese because we'll all be so blue if the notorious is no longer competing. I mean, when this tweet came out, I think most people thought, "Hey, this is a joke, right?" Connor the comic, and then Nate Diaz tweeted out, "Haha, mission accomplished." I guess I'm retiring too. Then his coach came out and sort of insinuated that it wasn't a joke. And then Ari Hawani sort of confirmed that his sources were saying that there was something else going on here, that it wasn't a joke. And then boom, Dana White pulled him from the UFC 200 card. Since then, we had the Facebook post from Conor McGregor basically saying, hey, I just wanted to focus on training. I've done enough media. I think I've earned the company enough money to get some leeway. And FYI, I'm not retired. So, Matt, thoughts? Ambiguity in those tweets. See, it's just like, oh, I'm re- I'm retiring young. Just that part would be like, well, yeah, you always plan to do that, but you could retire ten years from now and it would you'd still be young. But he's like, see you later. And you're like, oh, maybe he's waiting. But then when his coach tweeted, it was like, oh, it's been fun. And you're like, are you talking about the joke? That like, haha, and play, playing everybody on Twitter, now it's over, or like the ride's over, he's actually retiring. Um, but I think, you know, they're smart enough to, to play that up because I think all the factors go into it. One is like, it could be, you know, he's like legitimately spooked by being there, like, where another fighter dies, and that's like, I, it can't not affect him. Um, but there's also the fact of like maybe he's playing for more money from the USC and like having a power play. And then- oh, for sure. I think a, I think a lot of people I think a lot of people are speculating that it's a it's a power play. Um, y- you know, just uh, segueing back to our interview with with Gary just now. But you, you know, fighters' pay is if the fighters haven't had the ability to unionize and 
and it, it's not just an ability to form one it's the the leadership involved that's necessary it's the support involved all around support it, I think most fighters are like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get paid more. I'd like to be protected. I'd like to have a say, uh, a bigger say in some of these contractual negotiations, right? But you you need to do it in a unified fashion, and you need to have leadership to do that. And we've had some fighters that have tried to step up. Kung Lee, Tim Kennedy. You know, with George St. Pierre, um, when he was on the Ariel Hawani show, he said that he's he's currently in negotiation with the UFC. You know, for him, he says, I, I'm a fighter. My agents are actually the ones that are negotiating. That's fine. And he deals with what he's great at being one of the best mixed martial artists, if not the best mixed martial artists of all time. And that's great. And it seems like uh, he said that he's going through a training camp right now. He wants to see if his body can take it. If he can go through a full training camp, feel good. Then he would like to go back and compete. So he was saying it was after this training camp is when he would probably ramp up the, the negotiations, or rather his agents will start ramping up the negotiations. But the stumbling block there is that Reebok deal. I think that's a that's a bigger stumbling block than potentially what Connor's dealing with. I think with Connor, you just you, you load up a, a, a dump truck with gold coins and, and you, you drop it by his McMansion, and that might solve that problem. But the, the Reebok deal, that's, that's a completely different thing that'd be harder to... That's a harder thing to get around. Either way, it's great that these two big stars, Conor McGregor and George St. Pierre, respectively, are sort of standing up to the UFC. Uh, I think, like I said, Conor's problem is a little bit easier to solve. But it should be good in general for fighter negotiations moving forward. You know, what's really funny is these two have been linked as a potential super fight. Yeah, they were talking about that about at, um, 196. He was in the audience for, you know, the Diaz McGregor fight and he had not been in he had not been in attendance of a UFC event since his retirement. And you're like, Oh, he just happens to be sitting in the front row. Um, so like one of the theories was that if Connor won he was gonna call out um, GSP afterwards and be like, Yeah, we thought you were two hundred but uh, that didn't happen. Nate Diaz was not supposed to win that fight according to the UFC. <laughs> Yeah. And like, just think of, just think from the UFC's perspective. They're like, man, we lost Ronda, and then she went into hiding, so we couldn't have all these like Ronda fest shows, where basically Ronda's the only reason why people come to the card. And now their other cash cow, Connor, loses to Nate. All right, that's fine. He's he's still a warrior. He's gonna come to 200. Ah, oh, snap. And uh, it it seems like there's a lot of. There's enough speculation out there. Ariel, he talked with Luke Thomas immediately after. Dana White announced that he was pulled from the 200 card about reasons why Connor's doing this and if this retirement is real or if it's simply just a power play and he's not going to be on 200 but maybe he'll headline New York or something like that. And Dana White, he switched from being a boxer sizing instructor to a spinning instructor because that guy has been making the TV rounds, trying to spin the story and do some damage control. According to him, this was absolutely not about money. This is absolutely about money. And beyond that, it is about compensation, fighters' compensation. You know, Connor made this clear in that post on Facebook. He's brought a lot of money into that organization. And he's saying, you know, I want some leeway because I've, I've made so much money for you guys. Time is money, and you want me to take my time out of my training to help you guys once again sell a fight which I've been doing a hell of a job of. So I think his short-lived retirement is about compensation on one hand, and on the other hand, I think seeing a fighter die in the cage doing what he does and not necessarily taking any kind of damage that was out of the ordinary or having um, any protocols broken or something like that. You know, this goes back to the conversation I just had with Gary, but you know, fighter compensation goes a long ways to minimize the risk that fighters are, are willing to take. And Connor probably seen that's like, man, that is part of my profession. It probably makes him think, you know, I make a lot of money for his organization. This is a dangerous sport. I mean, we don't have any sources that say he did ask for more money, but it definitely puts into perspective him saying, hey, I don't want to stop my training right now to go do even more promotion for you guys. So I think all of these factors help inform us of 
what exactly is going on with this entire crazy process. And, and you, you said about what's it called, money playing. It is really important. Like, it makes a lot of decisions for, like, it, it weighs pretty heavily on guys when they're fighting. Like, like, oh, can you continue? Like, well, shit, I don't want to pull out of this fight because that means, like, 10 or 20 grand, like, for me and my fight team, too. Um, Matt Mitrioni brought that up. He said, it was like when he got eye pokes. He's like, man, I don't want to lose that money. I mean, if he takes a no contest, how's he going to take him to that LASIK surgery? Oh. <laughs> that's like that's like funny, not so funny, because that, that was like for real, though. Like, that, that, was a, that was a legitimate concern, and his eye was messed up. That, <laughs> like that should have been cold. <laughs> yeah, that absolutely, absolutely crazy. But he's, he's enjoyed it over there in Bellator now, so good for him. I like him. He's 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 quite a character, so it's always fun. It's always fun, and um, you know, never a dull moment in the world of MMA, huh? Yeah, <laughs> year round, no season, so always interesting. Yeah, that's 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 the thing. No off season. I mean, there there's free agency periods that seem to kind of happen like throughout the year because it, it's more when the contracts for the individual fighter ends versus some kind of particular season for the the league or organization that they're part of. But uh, yeah, the big one coming up, Rory McDonald, when his fight contract is up, after his fight with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. That should be a hell of a fight. Looking forward to that one. But we'll see. Will the UFC pay to retain their talent? You know, the, the UFC, we've talked about this. The UFC has always put itself above the fighters it's branding first the ufc is the draw and you know the fighters happen to be part of of that draw and we, we have some fighters that have tried to stand up to them in the past to different levels of success we we talked about how nick diaz off the air we talked about how nick diaz has did something similar to what connor did and refused to do the promo with his uh the first time he was scheduled to fight george st pierre you know the ufc was basically like no, we're not playing that well, it looks like they're not playing it with Connor either, but obviously Connor has a little bit more leverage, um, just in terms of drawing power, and, and he he has in the past been more of a team player than Nick. Nick has always kind of like you know done his own thing, um, been a little bit of a headache. So we'll see. I mean, this is crazy. The sport needs Connor McGregor for both sides too, just uh, in terms of growing it, and for the UFC and like management, and also. I think that is also going to lead. Well, he's like, I'm going to change your bone lives. Like, actually, in a way, like if this is part of a power play, and that is actually helping to raise fighter pay and like raise awareness of like the issues that fighters face. So he really is doing both. And if they end up giving way a little bit to Conor McGregor, that could be the catalyst. That, that maybe starts a, a bit of a change and, and emboldens the fighters and, and maybe unites them a little bit. They're like, look, we, we, can, we can stand up united and, and maybe have a little bit more of a say. It's a, at the end of the day, it's a partnership. I don't want to make it seem like the UFC is like this evil corporation taking advantage of people or something like that. I mean, these fighters are getting their opportunity because of the UFC. They're, you know, the UFC is paying them. They are making a livelihood based on this company. So they have an incentive for the UFC to do well. I mean, these fighters can't just like go off and, and do their own thing in, in another organization and get that same kind of profile that the UFC gives them, being the organization that they are. And it's taken a long time to build up that reputation and build the sport. Yeah, for sure. The fact that like, you know, you have ESPN covering them now that they're featured on uh, Fox Sports. Uh, they've they've come such a long way so we are going to man i started i started talking about this we got sidetracked a little bit but we're going to start a little series here i'm going to i'm working on this with matt and it's going to be called my biggest fight yet and what's it going to be about it's going to be looking at all the stuff that a fighter goes through um from like you know getting geared towards that like the, the mindset of it, the psychology that has them decide it, but then health and medical care issues and like worrying about themselves both short and long term, uh, worrying about their pay and um, their camps, loyalty to camps and like how they train, um, how they self promote and manage their own careers. Um, look at some other things, larger scale like unionization and then you know, DOC and They've been bringing up the Ali Act and state commissions and other stuff to get involved. 
Um, and that just is, you know, overall, like, what makes them do this? Like, keeping the eyes on the prize and striving to be the best. It's like a win or lose, what is the mentality of a fighter? And probably bring in some retired fighters like Gary to bring in a perspective about, like, you know, what makes them tick and why do they want to do this and what do they have to go through? Like, a very personal angle as to what a fighter is. We're going to start having those up on the site, brosbros.com. You guys will want to check it out. We're going to accompany this podcast with uh, an introduction to that series. You guys will want to check that out. Matt, appreciate you doing this, buddy. Thanks, man. Before okay. we go, I have a laundry list of funny things to make you laugh. Okay. And BJ Penn touched me in my naughty place, but that didn't violate me as bad as the articles on his website. Um, Ryan Davis thinks Dominic Cruz's body transformation is fishy, but I hate to tell him that's just puberty. Don't worry, bro. You'll hit it sometime before you turn 40. Um, the stock and slap is now in UFC 2, which is nice because I'll be able to finally bitch slap my favorite fighters and not wind up dead. Um, Dana White said that Rose no longer needs one or two more fights before she gets a title shot, but that really means six to eight months before her hair grows back so we can market her. Oh, God. I'm glad that I sleep on my back. Otherwise, Michael Chase, I might take it. Uh, Rashad Evans got $150,000 to lose in two minutes. Somehow, I don't think his intervention is going to go so well. They're like, no, bro, you got to quit. Quit while you're ahead. He's like, man, I'm in pretty good shape. I'm having a resurgence. Um, I made $150,000 in less than two, in two minutes. I didn't even have to switch to Geico. And then, you know, looking forward to UFC 197, John Jones says he was addicted to marijuana. And I fully expect Bob Saget from half Bank to pop out and with his explanation of why marijuana is not a drug. And then the other side of the arena, Mighty Mouse will be like, You hell for some marijuana? Move this man! Wow, man. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are excellent always a pleasure having you on the show my friend Matt Two Stripe Alexander uh, now Three Stripe but we're still going to call him Two Stripe uh, no, it, you know we, we gotta it keeps you humble you know no, even when you're a black belt one of these days you're still going to be Two Stripe to me <laughs> I'll be I'll be a second degree black belt maybe 15 or 20 years from now yeah uh, and then they'll be like oh th- th- thanks thanks for uh, just thanks for respecting me bro in a full circle. Alright guys, if you like this, then give us a thumbs up. Subscribe for the latest Bros Bros. And uh, check out our website. It's awesome. Brosbros.com. Anything else you want to add for our listeners, Matt? Um, no. Keep it real. Yeah. Also, I want to add, you guys can listen to us on SoundCloud. We're on iTunes. All sorts of places. If you want to listen to the bros on the go... We got you. All right. Guys, until next time, we are the Bros Bros You Knows.